but we're going to jump right in to round two, which starts with for you with Marvin Harrison. And I have him all the way back at 206 for some of the reasons I talked about. We're going to split these up with our ceiling banana shorts. I talked about in the first short, if you listen to the long audio, I just said it a minute ago, but I was a little bit concerned about how he fits together with Trey McBride. And a, a part of this for me, Sean, very specifically is something that you mentioned when you're talking about Brock Bowers coming up vis-a-vis where neighbors and um, Harrison are ranked and, and that people are getting very excited about the young profiles, but that we also kind of expect people to start to figure out that the tight end ascension is real. And this is a really unique young group of tight ends. And then also when we're talking about a, 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 a scoring system like tight end premium to say, well, I mean, if Trey McBride and Marvin Harrison are the new Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill, well, we take the Travis Kelsey a little higher in tight end premium. And so that's how I ranked it is to say that I, I actually think that's it, this is not necessarily meant to be a knock on Harrison as much as it is to say that I think Trey McBride is the next Travis Kelsey. But that's where I get Harrison at 206. You have him at 201. Any big ben, thoughts on on him? Because I didn't let you comment on him before. <laughs> well, I I – <laughs> I've got to give you a little bit of a hard time because I feel like I have played the role of Marvin Harrison skeptic from the perspective of when I wrote the rookie 101 series, I said Marvin Harrison may be the best prospect since Calvin Johnson. If you want to interpret the numbers in certain ways, then you can see that the size athleticism profile with the numbers, with what the film crowd sees about him with where the Cardinals picked him in the draft. It's an elite profile. So the targets per out run stuff, the weighted targets per out run stuff is really strong. Both of the last two years, incredible seasons. In part to, again, kind of reiterate this idea that there is a tiny bit of structural risk. I moved him to the two Oh one. I, I don't, I, I haven't too. I'm not sure how you got him following the next five spots. <laughs> I mean, you've got him behind two Chiefs wide wide receivers who might like, but I so you've here's also why. got him behind here's AJ why. Brown, who I'll tell you why is it's like purely seven because years down the line from where Marvin Harrison is yeah. gonna be next year. It's purely because I think he's going to fail relative to ADP because people have put too high of expectations on him. I wrote a piece this morning um, from a question that I got in a Reddit AMA I did recently. uh, How early should we really be drafting Kyle Pitts? And I made the case that he'd be going a lot higher if he wasn't Kyle Pitts. If he wasn't, that basically shouldn't be going no lower than the tight end three was the answer to my question for anyone who doesn't want to go read the piece. It wasn't paywalled. You could go read it as well. But that drafters, and this is really kind of one of the last edges, over respond to players not hitting expectations and then they can't they refuse to see the the profile clearly the next year i think it's fair from a perspective of when you're an analyst you don't want to be charged with bias but the people that are in on the player come out on the player and the player that were already out on the player get more out on the player and the player just cannot get properly evaluated that's not going to happen in an extreme way to harrison because he's going to be good he's going to be very good i do think He's going to underperform his ADP this year. And I think he's going to be uh, like a minus win rate player. I think he's going to be like a silent killer type. Like we talk about with running backs where the volume is just not going to be enough. And the other guys around him are going to be bigger hits, more meaningful hits, unless he really hits a, that spike week in the fantasy playoffs. But I think Drake London can hit a spike week in the fantasy playoff. I think Chris Olave can hit. I mean, these guys can have 12 targets in a game too. Why, why is it only Harrison? That can, well, that's the point I was trying to make on the first show is that those guys will be doing that stuff from week one, right? And the, 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 what, Harris, what people want Harrison to do at the end of the year, those guys can do all year potentially in their breakout scenarios. Sorry, go ahead. They could. And what you outlined, I think, is I mean, for me, the Marvin Harrison blow up scenario in part relies on the idea that it's really a two person offense. I guess I am very skeptical about Michael Wilson and I'm skeptical about Greg Dorch, even though I think Dorch is a fantastic role player. I think if you're 
expecting those guys to be real parts yeah. of the offense, you're probably wrong. And yet, from a humility-based perspective, I'm concerned that they're generating so many raves. And it doesn't really take them siphoning many targets before you get very concerned about Harrison and maybe even a tiny bit concerned about Trey McBride. The other thing we've mentioned on the show is that James Conner is coming off of his best season and looks like he is ready to go on a rampage and then just Kyler will run some. And so the pie is going to be potentially a problem. The point that you make about the disappointment though is very real. I do think that Marvin Harrison would have to be pretty bad because I I think the way people are structured on it is simply that if his highlights are there, everybody's going to be like, okay, well, we were a little bit overly enthusiastic, but this is the year that he jumped. I mean, similar to where you and I are with Garrett Wilson, where we're like, I mean, it's there. He's going to make the jump. You should be it. Yeah, that's a great point. I will... um... You clearly state that I, I'm too low on Harrison. This is one of those misses where I'm like, even right when you said it, I was like, I got I, I should move him back up. Really what I was saying, Sean, is that I, I wrote about that topic this morning. And so as I did my rankings right after sending that, that post out, right before we started our show, it was very fresh in mind. And the other element of that was the thing where I ranked neighbors at the back of the first round. And I said, well, if I actually think neighbors out produces Harrison, I think there's a little bit of a pushback on Harrison, even if he is just a small loss type player. Like, I still think he's going to be good. I don't think he's going to be really bad, but I think the perception would be wrong and then would would overly, you know, hit him and say, well, Neighbors was better, right? And like, because there's these two really great rookies, but Neighbors is better, we were wrong on Harrison. He's not good, which is not really what it would mean in the way that I'm visualizing the season. I'm just visualizing Neighbors being the focal point of his offense and Harrison maybe needing to build into that throughout the season more in the, in a way that perception is negatively biased against Harrison because of multiple factors that the, the over um, the, 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 the too high ADP, the too high expectations. And then the fact that the other rookie is actually outperforming him. And then it's like, well, he's not even as good as the other rookie. It's, it's to some degree, Sean, it, it, it's one of these things where, and we talked about this with Pitts, where people were like tweeting at Kyle Pitts and talking about how much he sucks and how crappy he is. And we we're like, this in season, I remember, like, we we're like, I, it makes me sad to be a part of the fantasy community when that stuff happens. To some degree, it bothers me that we've already put Marvin Harrison, in part because of his name and everything else, on such a pedestal that I do think he's going to be getting these these tweets. Why you're a bum? You're you're not doing enough for me in week three when he has a three target game because he's a rookie. Like give, I mean, we we have now put him to such a level that the worst among us are going to act like he needs to play like, you know, peak freaking Jamar Chase week one, or something's well, wrong with him. And you know, you think about Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase, what they did, but you think about the guy who's the best receiver in football coming off of last year and CD Lamb, and it was a progression. Yeah. And what you're saying right there with Marvin Harris, I mean, he's been set up to fail. Now that doesn't mean he will because he could simply right. be that good. But it is a little bit unfortunate because the price this year, I think you and I would both argue, and maybe incorrectly, but we would argue has been wrong. When you're saying I love that, that point other... about about Lamb, and I just want to I just want to mention that 1.81 yard, yards per out run as a rookie, 2.06 in year two, 2.38 in year three, 2.78 last year. You see that progression, like you said. Each year, I, I just use yards per out run. We could do the same thing with targets per out run, yards per target, et cetera. He wasn't bad as a rookie. He's the best receiver in football right now. He's the wide receiver one, though. And to get there, you don't do that right away in year one necessarily. I talk about Jefferson and Chase's rookie years. You make a great point on Lamb that like he's actually viewed above Jefferson and Chase right now, at least going into this year in 2024 expectations. And he didn't hit it as a rookie on their level. And, and for me, even the way that those guys hit, is probably a disappointment in Harrison's ADP. He has to be Puka Nakua or bust is sort of what it feels like. And I'm not saying that this in any way, shape or form means that Lamb was a better prospect or is going to be better or is better, what have you. But you know, even just thinking back to the collegiate profiles, Lamb's final year numbers in terms of yards per route at Oklahoma were better than what Harrison did last year for Ohio State. Harrison had two of the best seasons in recent memory, and yet they're not gapped in a way that would tell you we've got to draft him as a rookie at the one, two, right. Right. And there's a main, and and, and, you know, again, there might be some inconsistency with the way that we're playing neighbors. And I'm, you know, saying that I, so 
confident on neighbors. It's it's a little bit that the neighbors sets up more like he has to get all the volume from week one. It's also that there's a meaningful difference between the one, two turn and the two, three turn. And I think that's the part that sort of jumped the shark for me that I just want to emphasize is like Harris had never falls to the two, three turn neighbors for periods of this off season, You could get it like three ten. You know, he was a two, three turn guy, but would also fall well into round three sometimes in some of these drafts. Harrison has like, I think the latest I've seen him go was like 18. Like, I don't know if this dude's ever made it to the end of round two in a draft that I've seen. The expectation has been that he is right there. And for some people, he's literally in that, that top 12 and Harrison, like he's like a part of that group or has been all off season. I just, there's a lot of anchoring to the Kyle Kyler Murray with Deandre Hopkins best season. And I just would also note that there've been other people who played with Kyler Murray and, didn't receive maybe the same bump. I think we have to have at least a tiny bit of skepticism too about Murray as a passer, even though his peripherals at times have been very good. That part also worries me as someone who lives in Arizona, is an Arizona fan, tracks their games. You watch some of the games and he's not one of these guys where I'm like, he's going to launch this guy to superstardom by himself. There's like no risk he's not that level of passer, even though he is well above average. Yeah. He's very, very good. We're going to talk about him during the super flex section. Cause even though I moved Harrison down in mine, I, you know, surprise or spoiler alert, have Kyler a little higher than you. Cause I do still think that the combination of McBride and Harrison are going to be so exciting this year that going into next year, I think Kyler's going to rebound in value quite a bit. So that's, that'll be a fun one to talk about as we get to the super flex discussion. But Harrison was a fun conversation there. You have met 201. I've met 206. I think a lot of people would have thought that he might've been top five, right? Like top five overall in the first round. We are not necessarily there with it. And yet I would argue putting him at 206 going into year two is still a really aggressive ranking. I mean, how many, you know, year two receivers are, are ever ranked even higher than that. I mean, it, it feels like a, a, a massive, a, a massive fade because he's going higher as a rookie. And I do think you're right. And I did admit that I probably should have him closer to 201. My 201, Sean, is your 208. And I, you gave me a little bit of a hard time because um, I was telling you that, that Marvin Harrison was such a, uh, you know, you were saying that neighbors could be a better prospect than Harrison. And I was saying, Sean, I don't know. Harrison might just be a generational prospect. And then we get to this exercise and I, embarrassed you as the the Marvin Harrison bull who you're like oh, I wish I would have ranked him as low as Ben did well now we get to a player that you are just not as high as me on and that's Xavier Worthy <laughs> I love that you have Xavier Worthy at the 201 I am trying to I mean I'm drafting him occasionally at the four or five turn in which case he better be someone who is in the second round mix you I, also have Rasheed Rice at the 202. I'm going to assume that when we get to the super flex portion of this, you have Patrick Mahomes at the 101, and then like you're holding the next two or three spots blank just to represent that Big Lebowski or Deadwood sized gap between him and the next uh, thing in his category. And, I... and you, you've been consistent. You like this Kansas City Chiefs offense for 2024. That, uh, I just I just kind of came at you on on Kyler your your super flex ranking of Kyler relative to McBride and Harrison and the fact that I have Mahomes I, I, I'm gonna move ahead to super flex on him too I have him at 106 which is just like it's not consistent with with the Xavier Worthy and Rasheed Rice ranking at all the Xavier Worthy and Rasheed Rice one I get asked about this comparison a lot I've made this point basically since the off season I feel very strongly about it. Rasheed Rice did a lot of stuff in the short to intermediate range last year. He got a really high targets per out run. He had a 2.4 yards per out run as a rookie with Patrick Mahomes, even though, as a lot of people pointed out, his route tree and all of that stuff was very limited. He was mostly in this yak role, a lot of design stuff, a lot of quick hits. I do think some of that stuff will pass over to some of the speed guys that they had, like Marquise Brown and Xavier Worthy. We are recording this after Marquise Brown's injury. Worthy and Rice, Brown got hurt on the first play, but Worthy and Rice were the other receivers with him on, on that first possession of preseason week one. 
Sky Moore came on after Hollywood Brown got hurt and then stayed on after Mahomes went out. But for that first drive, and Worthy and, and Rice were done for the day at that point. For that first drive, or I don't know if Worthy was done for the day. That's not that's not true. But I know, I'm pretty sure Rice was. Rice played 100% of the snaps with Patrick Mahomes. Worthy played 75%. But for that first drive, they came out with the three receivers that we expect them to come out with. But I had minor concerns this offseason. I talked to you about this, Sean, that they might – slow play worthy a little bit but now with the concern about the Rasheed Rice suspension which maybe is getting less and less concerning as we go here and it's funny I have him ranked so high but like if that suspension does get pushed to 2025 then I'm gonna look stupid he's not gonna go 202 but the Rasheed Rice suspension risk and now the Mar- the Marquise Brown injury is really gonna accelerate Xavier Worthy's timeline and and the more important element of the that was true if you paid attention to them bringing in Brown and then drafting, trading up to draft in the first round, Xavier Worthy, which is different than any other receiver like they've ever brought in. It's not trading back in the second round to draft, you know, Rasheed Rice, who they, they they spent some more time letting him develop throughout the year last year, but they obviously want to add that speed element back to their offense. They didn't have it last year. Marquez Valdez Scantling was their downfield weapon. He earned a target per out on like 9% of dropbacks. They're making a huge show of it in, in camp. They're going deep every single chance they can. Mahomes had this low A dot last year. They want to get back to stretching the field vertically and forcing defenses to take away the explosive plays, right? And Xavier Worthy is going to play because of that. And that's extremely bullish, or it seems like he's going to play a lot. And that's, I think, extremely bullish for him because I think then he produces. We both really like the profile. We talked about even before the – Fastest ever 40 time at the combine. This guy had a really strong t- volume earning profile, targets per out run profile at multiple depths. He could earn stuff shallow. His college team thought they needed to give him the ball. You pointed out to me, he was the second best recruit in his class coming out of high school. This is not a like a recent, oh, he just got fast in college. And now, you know, like this guy was expected to be able to play in the NFL from the time he graduated high school. That's a, Different class of prospect than he gets credit for because he's a little bit undersized in some of those things. There's been camp reports, you know, and those videos that he's been pushed to the ground on on jam plays, and so now he can't play. He's, I I think, is going to make enough plays as a rookie and enough splash plays, and that also this offense, passing offense, is going to look a lot more dynamic. So this is where it's funny that I do have Mahomes probably a little too low because I am. They're gonna their pass rate over expecting is going to be very high again. It's been first in the league for five straight years. And they've gotten so much better at receiver that I do think there's going to be a lot more of an explosive play element to their offense again. And then Rice is that guy that, along with Kelsey, benefits from the way that that softens up the underneath area of these defenses. They're going to have to go back to playing quarters coverage and all this, like, you know, cover two shell and these deep, deep zones. The thing about Worthy is I don't think that's all he can do. I think he's going to also get manufactured touches around the line of scrimmage, and he's going to be able to run in the short and intermediate range as well on some plays where they're going to want – because they can use Marquise Brown as the vertical element, right? It's not like he Worthy has to be the clear-out guy. And like some, some offenses, there's a deep guy that just is the guy that's attacking downfield every play. And this is one that they now have two elements, and they want to start them both, and they did in the preseason. And so you can have Worthy – using that speed to get cushion, right? And then be the underneath route, actually, as as Hollywood is the deep route in a particular concept. And it creates all this. That's why he's able to get underneath target rate as well. Because cornerbacks at the college level, and it will happen at the pro level too, because he runs a 4-2, have to give you cushion when you're that fast. And you can just run right by him. He Xavier Worthy with Patrick Mahomes is like too simple to overthink for me. I, I would understand the concern about Rasheed Rice, who you don't even have here. You obviously are very in on Worthy as well. For me to put them at 201, 202, definitely quite bullish. I think when you start thinking through the way that this pass game is going to take a step forward and Patrick Mahomes is going to reassert himself as a really dominant scoring quarterback as far as the passing numbers go. And the biggest reason that I have him 106 is I have so many mobile quarterbacks ranked ahead of him, but the passing numbers are going to be strong again. And you're also going to have Kelsey a year older. And I do think we're going to see Kelsey's routes dip. I do think we're going to see Kelsey get a couple games off this year, like almost like load management where he's going to pick up some small injury and they're going to set him down for two weeks. And I think these young receivers are really going to shine during those periods. And that rice is particularly going to look like that Kelsey short and intermediate weapon 
where Worthy and, and Marquise Brown are the more vertical weapons. It fits together so well. So how do you have them 201, 202? The answer to me is they are the most complimentary future players for Patrick Mahomes that you could really want them to be. It's two really fun profiles and two really fun assets. I think Rasheed Rice is probably ends up being the bigger volume and Worthy winds up being the bigger explosive play guy, but still with the consistent volume, like I talked about, we'll get stuff in the shorter area of the field as well. I think he'll have enough targets too. I think we'll go into next year and people will be projecting this Kansas City offense like we were way too low on all their the aggregate of their passing weapons last year. We got to have two guys up there again, and it won't be Kelsey. So it'll be Worthy and Rice in, in my mind. And, and Marquise Brown's on a one-year contract. Might not even be on the team next year. I think I think the future of this passing game is Xavier Worthy and Rasheed Rice in these complementary roles. Do I have them too high at 201, 202? Yeah, I do. But I do think we're going to get them both ranked very, very high next year. So I have Worthy at the 208. I was not expecting to be so outdone on that <laughs> ranking. You would describe how it would work. And I think that they're going to be some fantasy managers out there who are skeptical and yet on a team quarterbacked by Brock Purdy, we basically have had what you described with the 49ers. Right. And Brandon Ayuk, very good. Debo Samuel, even better from the perspective that Samuel has this unique profile that basically no other receiver can really match. We're probably moving into the time frame where Kittle and Kelsey swap places in terms of who is the bigger threat to the receiving options on the team. And so right now, in part because Brock Purdy was so ridiculously efficient last year, you know, you have those 49ers receivers up there, even though they have Christian McCaffrey and George Kittle. And because we believe in efficiency and believe in talent, we're still okay with those prices. And you could get a similar thing like that with the Chiefs. Which we've seen with Tyreek and Kelsey before. Like th that's the main thing for me is like I think we're gonna by the end of this year see the future of this passing game as these two guys. My thought would be, and part of this just kind of even goes back to all of the pushback that I've received from having a pretty aggressive ranking on Worthy and Dynasty, despite what he has done in the past, despite how fast he is, and despite who his quarterback is going to be, that I think that some of the questions with Worthy will probably persist and that he's going to remain really small. There are some things about what happened in college where he's playing injured that probably uh you know really juice those drop rates but it's also probably the case that he's not going to be ever a fantastic contested catch guy and they have other weapons and so if fantasy managers look at that and say we're never really comfortable moving him to the one two turn that wouldn't surprise me i do think he'll and be their number rice the one like I was making the case before all Rice off field stuff when he was going two three in the pre draft period before Worthy was on the team that he actually belonged at the one two turn and not the two three turn. If if Worthy has those questions, then isn't Rice a lock at the one two turn? I guess I don't think so because Worthy's going to look better, right? And so then you have <laughs> Worthy kind of anchored into a certain area, which then anchors Rice behind him, and you still have. Travis Kelsey, maybe we get this big season from Pacheco that you and I are skeptical of, but it's certainly possible. Mm -hmm. And then you have these things holding them down a little bit. The thing I would note is that even before the injury, I mean, I'm pretty optimistic about Marquise Brown having a bounce back season. It was difficult for me to see. You had to make some pretty strong assumptions about Worthy being a niche player and Rice being suspended for a long time to have Brown ahead of those two guys. So that part of the pricing I've never really been comfortable with or didn't think was quite right. And if that's my thesis about the current pricing, it does lend itself to this idea that Worthy and Rice could be in this range. I guess if Rice doesn't get suspended this year, then he's going to have a big enough season that people are then going to say, I mean, we should consider him in the second round next year, even if he is suspended. Yeah, I'm if kind of ignoring suspended the suspension. Year, yeah, <laughs> yeah, which I think is fine, which I think is, yeah. is, the, is the way to do it, to think through like what he does on a per-game basis when he's on it's the field. It's basically what I'm doing, yeah. He probably doesn't belong at 202 be, 
because he's either missing time this year or next year. We almost know that for certain. And so one of those things is going to cause him some trouble. But I do like that. Uh, then we've got some some similar guys here. You're a little bit lower on Gibbs. We went through that element a little bit in the first show. We have Puka both ranked in the same general range. You're at 203. I'm at 206. I think that Cooper Cup is going to outscore him this year. But then when you look into 2025, the difference in age becomes even more glaring. So I think that Puka ends up as a pretty clear-cut second-round pick unless he gets absolutely just swamped by Cup. You've made the case that it's possible that these guys have a hard time both performing. Your aggressive rank on Puka, you're thinking he's going to basically be healthy for the season and think he's going to be the number one this year, or you think they both could score pretty well? It's a little bit like, no, I mean, I think he's the number one this year that he's, I haven't fallen from where he was. I mean, you're calling this an aggressive rank, but I'm, I'm pre- predicting a year two guy who was going at 110 until his knee injury to fall to 203, right, in into year three. So that, I think... You don't think that we were going to get a, a correction in these last anyway. couple of weeks anyway? I mean, it, we might not. I guess the reports out of camp were... And, and it, you know, we've made the case that the first round is really good. One of the th- reasons why he's locked into that range is that once Garrett Wilson goes, if you want to pick a receiver, it, it sort of goes back to our conversation about Harrison, where you're almost pushed to select puka to select harrison or to make a really strong statement about someone like a chris olave or a drake london yeah and that's fair like in terms of how that has kept him up but i've made the case on him specifically that when he was going one two and cup was going three four that if you really liked the cup at three four it was hard to envision puka hitting at one two and that he's more like a mid-second value and I, i got pushback on that because I think people look at the rookie year and they say it's the greatest rookie season ever. And I don't want to overthink this. I mean, he had 160 targets and he was an absolute superstar. Now I was sharing some stats with you, Sean, that I wrote up in uh, my off season stealing signals post about the Rams last year. You part of the reason I shared them with you is pre-show. You had started talking about how, you know, Kyron ran really well for them. And it was the first time, that they've run effectively basically since Todd Gurley. And I didn't realize how poor they had been between that gap, but I did write in my thing already that basically once Kyron got established last year, their offense slowed down a little bit, went a little bit more run heavy, actually a lot more run heavy. Their pass rate was 55% after week five plays per game, slightly below average. If you look at their full season numbers, their pass rate looks more reasonable. Their plays per game are higher because in the first five games, They had their three highest play volume games, their three highest pass rate games. They weren't even the same three games. It was like the first five games was a different offense. They were over 297 air yards in all five games, which is a very you know specific number. But my point is basically 300 plus air yards. They were just shy of it in one game. They had more than that once the rest of the regular season. They were below 200 in six of their remaining 12 games after those first five games. So the remaining 12 games last year, was different. And they, and part of that was like, they went from two, two at well to Demarcus Robinson because of the run blocking. They went out and re-signed Demarcus Robinson this off season to a $4 million guaranteed deal. No one was given Demarcus Robinson 4 million this off season. They wanted to make sure he was coming back. I mean, like that's a good deal for his market. They sign, uh, they draft another running back that is supposedly a clone to their starting running back to have redundancy for that element of it. I don't think it's going to be a run heavy team. I think you do need to reckon with the fact that Puka had, 20 targets and 15 targets in the first two games. And then from that point on was, a you know, 142 target pace, but he finished with 160 total. And that was a little bit of a different offense those first four games, not just because Cup wasn't in the offense, but because of how they went a little more run heavy. And then you look at the full season, you go, yeah, Puka had an incredible rookie year, 1,500 yards. But Cup had 700 yards. He played hurt all year. Either you think Cup is going to have another really rough year Or if you think he comes back and at least adds from 700 up to 1,000 plus, and you think through that they're going to be a little bit actually maybe slower paced and maybe a little bit run heavy as I was just talking through, it becomes really tough to see Nakua putting up the same numbers that he did last year. That's something we've talked about this offseason, Sean, where it's like if he puts up the same year as last year, that's a massive win. There's a lot of people, though, that believe year one player did that. 
you're two step forward and they, they can't. That's why I've all off season been bringing back the comp that you gave in the season last year, which is Anquan Bolden, where his rookie year ended up being one of the top two seasons of his career. His other really peak season was his third year, but like everything came together for him that it was like an 80th percentile outcome for him. He went on to a long and productive season. That's a career. That's why I like that comp. Naku is going to be a good football player his whole career. But also, 2023 is going to go down as one of his best seasons. He's not going to go on to have way better seasons over and over and over again just because we like to think that rookies then go up a level in year two. Sometimes you have to realize that like that was an exceptional rookie year for reasons that are hard to repeat. And well, so we anyway, earlier I, about how CD Lamb took this progression. The flip side of that is that Jamar Chase has looked more human since his rookie season. Now he's still being drafted in this range of someone who was Jamar Chase in college, Jamar Chase from a draft pick perspective, and then Jamar Chase as a rookie. Puka doesn't have those first two pieces, which is why he's one, two turn as opposed to top five. The thing that you mentioned there about Bolden, right? He has to play with Larry Fitzgerald. It's very relevant that Puka just had one of the greatest rookie seasons of all time. And yet we're just a couple of years removed from Cooper Cup averaging just a hair under 26 points per game and then going off in the reality playoffs. You can't simply wave away a guy who in the recent past has been able to author a receiving season that's in the mix with a Calvin Johnson with a Randy Moss type of player who has been supposedly back to that level in camp. And, you know, if anything, maybe we should be looking at Matthew Stafford and saying that's an exploitable opportunity. But again, for the reasons that you mentioned, if the offense doesn't really function that way. And I don't think Stafford can really be can be played because I think both Puka and Cup can can justify these ADPs independent of each other because of how concentrated it can be. But there's not enough secondary passing it's just to these guys and and then they run right like who else is going to catch passes to marcus robinson no he's run blocking like i mean i've drafted him in late in best ball but there's You're basically no one else when he leads the team in touchdowns <laughs> to, to, to marcus robinson well i mean it's gonna help on my on my best ball team sean because it's gonna be that uh james jones yeah I Packers. took him in the, the very late rounds, especially in like the eliminator. Cause I'm like, dude, this guy's going to run a lot of routes. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. But yeah, you mentioned it. Um, I have Puka at two Oh three. So I start the second round, Xavier worthy, Rashi rice, Puka Nakua. You start at Marvin Harrison, who we just discussed and Jameer Gibbs at two Oh two. You have Nakua at two Oh six. I have Harrison at two Oh six. So we both have both of those guys in the first half of the second round, just flipped a little bit. You have Gibbs at 202. I have him at 205. So we both have Gibbs sort of falling a little. I know for me, Sean, it was, look, I and because I also dropped Laporta a little, which we'll get to in a second. But I dropped Amon Ra, I dropped Gibbs, and I dropped Laporta from where they're going in tight end premium right now. If you go do a tight end premium draft right now, or at least before Gibbs' hamstring injury, all three of those guys go in the top 15 picks. And it's like, they're all in the same offense. That's that's. You mentioned a minute ago how we do that with the Niners some. We're, we're doing it with the Lions for sure. I think there's an element here where it's like they all kind of slide. They all still are in the top two rounds next year because they're all good. They all kind of slide back a little bit. And so I had Gibbs at 205. I actually have Laporta all the way back at 209, which. So you're giving him the like Jalen Waddle treatment. It, it sounds you're like, like I'm out on him. He's just going to be disappointing despite. Okay, but you have him at 203, and he's going at the one two turn right now in tight end premium. You have him as your tight end three, so you're giving the Jim model treatment a little bit too. Am I right? A little again, I think I... we're somewhat in agreement here, was the way that I was going to frame that. Do you, do oh, you have a different okay. take? Well, you have AJ Brown well, ahead of him. <laughs> I, apparently I didn't drop AJ Brown enough. So I dropped AJ Brown to 204. He's going at the 110 or 111. I thought that was enough. Sean has him at um a 209. And so I'm five picks the bull on a guy that I'm dropping multiple that I think is the most talented receiver in the NFL potentially that I'm dropping, you know, half a round from where he's going this year. But apparently I'm not too high on him. Yeah, I think for me, Sam Laporta, it the question is how do you mix that? It, it's really fascinating 
with the Lions? Because we talk about the Lions versus the 49ers. And I guess what I would say is that I'm not off of Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk at their prices. And yet I think that they are gapped down from Amon Ra and Gibbs and Laporta in terms of what the Lions players actually give you from a talent perspective relative to their positions versus what the 49ers guys give you. Now, the interesting thing there is certainly I would say that Christian McCaffrey is the best running back in football. So it's not like an across the board. I'm picking all the Lions guys above all the 49ers guys. But when you think about it, I mean, I think Christian McCaffrey and then sort of weirdly George Kittle are the guys who are the massive, massive difference makers. And that's one of the reasons why I guess I've been a little bit skeptical about Brandon Ayuk and his trade requests because, I mean, he's one of these guys who was good, not great. And you put him in a different situation, maybe he doesn't flourish in quite the same way. <laughs> and it's been fun to track his uh, unwillingness to actually go to any of the teams that want him. When we think about Laporta, I mean, Laporta is basically a young Travis Kelsey. Jameer Gibbs, probably a young Marshall Falk. Amon Ross St. Brown, a young Cooper Cup. I, I, I can keep him that high, especially if there is some concern, or not concern, but just when we're trying to think about the likelihood that different things hit. I mean, Jamison Williams hitting maybe doesn't even really affect them because that's a handful of shot plays that don't take volume out for the rest of the team. Now, if he pulls an H hand and those are 60, 70 yard touchdowns, you create the problem of that drive just ends without those guys getting their touches on the drive. And then for me, one of the problems with the chiefs and the lions is just that when you look to the second half, these teams could be teams that are somewhat aggressive with leads and yet still not need to do the types of things that would help their sure. fantasy players because they're just going to be so far ahead. Now, the flip side of that is that the Chicago bears have become much more interesting. The green Bay Packers are suddenly one of the most yep. exciting teams in football. And the Minnesota Vikings have Justin Jefferson, yep. uh, Jordan Addison. They're going to get TJ Hawkinson back at some point. And, and Kevin they have a dome is and a fantastic play. head coach. Apparently the best play caller that's ever lived is what I'm hearing. But um, I'll, I'll give you some Sam Laporta fun because Sam Laporta was fan fantastic last year. However, I, I mentioned on the first show when we talked about Trey McBride that McBride was actually meaningfully better than Laporta on the per route stuff. Now, McBride's big note is that he didn't play full snaps until week eight. That's not great. He didn't play full snaps his rookie season either. So when I talk about this, I say that Laporta is clearly ahead of him in Dynasty. The fact that Laporta stepped on the field immediately and was a stud as a rookie matters. It took Laporta until year two. At the same time, or I mean, it took McBride until year two. At the same time, we know it takes some tight ends some time. And when McBride hit on a per out basis last year, he was at 25.9% targets per out run. These are PFF stats. Uh, Laporta was 23.3%. So 2.6 percentage points difference. Pretty meaningful. Um, Laporta had a little bit of a higher ADOT, which actually made their weighted targets per out run a little closer. And yet, despite Laporta having a little bit of a higher A dot, McBride had the meaningfully better, about a half a yard yards per target, which adds that yards after catch element, that efficiency element. Now, that's not saying that Laporta's bad at that part of it because Laporta was good too. But yards per out run, McBride actually 203. Laporta 176. Great for a 500 route rookie tight end. That's all very, very good. I'm just saying that it's not the greatest tight end season of all time. He was the tight end one last year, and he kind of gapped the field. But in half PPR, he only scored 192 points. Sean, the last time that the tight end one in half PPR didn't hit 200 points was 2017. So each of the five years prior, he would not have even been the tight end one. And he did so with 10 touchdowns, and no other tight end had more than six. I think that's all. That's a good thing. I'm not. You, I can see you squirming. The touchdowns are a good well, thing. I'm not saying that's right, a bad right. thing. But the catches and the targets and the yards were good. They were great, but they weren't the greatest tight end season of all time is all that I'm saying. Sure. And I think that there is some inconsistency perhaps in the way that I want to frame this with Laporta versus Nakua, where we're saying 
that Nakua from a profile perspective and then where he hit, it's so clearly at the top end of his range that the only thing that then you can work with from a range perspective is for him to come down, especially if he adds the competition of cup. Laporta already has that competition and the little cherry on top for me, when we think about the profile and where he's going again, is that he did it as a rookie. And then as an injured player in the playoffs, he scores in the first week, but then those next two games where they're trying to get to the Super Bowl and should have, I mean, they blew some big plays in the second half. I mean, <laughs> I didn't mean to like bring that up for myself. I just had a moment like of my body flushing with sadness yeah. from like how they blew that game in the playoffs. The second two games as an injured player, he goes 11 targets, nine receptions, 65 yards and 13 targets, nine receptions and 97 yards. Again, that doesn't mean he's going to start putting up those lines every week in his second season. No, but the numbers, I I think he is going to be extraordinary. The numbers I just gave were regular season only. So it's a really good point. I wasn't bringing in those, those playoff games. I, I should absolutely mention that. I'm sure that bumped up his targets per out run. 11 target game and a 13 target game is season high. Well, he had a 12 target game. He had a couple 11 of 10, but I mean, that 13 was the season high and 11 is right there alongside the season high. So those, I mean, yes, those playoff games are a great point right when they needed him the most. That is something that I was understating. Absolutely. Great point. Um, yeah. So I have him at, 209, I think you've made a convincing argument that I probably went a little too far with that. You have met 203. So my first six picks of the second round, let's get moving because there are some names at the back of the second round that we really got to discuss. But my first six picks are Xavier Worthy and Rasheed Rice that we talked about. You have Xavier Worthy at 208. You do not have Rice ranked. Puka Nakua, you have at 206. AJ Brown, you have at 209. Jameer Gibbs, who you have at 202. And Marvin Harrison, who you have at 201. And so your, your first six picks are Harrison Gibbs, who I have in those first six picks as well. Sam Laporta at 203. We just talked about him. Obviously, I have him at 209. Uh, Chris Alave, who we haven't talked about yet. You have him at 204. I have him at 212. I don't think we need to talk about him a ton. I I probably pushed him down too far, but it was, again, I talked about this at the top of the first show. Really hard to fit all these guys in. There's a couple names that neither of us ranked that surprised me that I couldn't get him in. Like Jalen Waddell, neither of us ranked. It surprised me that I couldn't fit him in, and it surprised me to see him not on your list, but that's why Alave is at 212. Is there's a lot of really r- good receiving profiles that could could fit here. And I would note then, that even though I think Olave is set up for a smash season because his overall profile, and you look at the weighted targets per yeah. route, for example, and then you think about what the competition for targets is, where there basically isn't any at all. And you think about Derek Carr being a slightly underrated reality quarterback and deep thrower that he is set up to hit on one of the best seasons that he's going to have. Like if Chris Olave has his best NFL season in 2024, that's almost the direction that I think we're pushing toward at the same time. He's always demonstrated enough weakness after the catch that maybe 204 overstates where he could legitimately get to from a forward looking perspective. Sure. Yeah. So maybe, maybe more like the late second, like I have him ranked, but you, you do have him 204 here and you have Nakua 206. I mentioned the one guy in our joint first halves of our second rounds that we have not said yet is Dalton Kincaid. You have him at 205. I highlighted him as a player that is on my um, near misses and I really wanted to rank. I ranked four tight ends. You ranked four tight ends. I'll go ahead and mention that at 208. Eight, I snuck Kyle Pitts in. Actually, a spot ahead of Laporta. And I and we can talk through that a little bit as well. But, Sean, when I did this, actually, I, I have Bowers at 211. We, you have Bowers at 107. We both have McBride. We both have Laporta. I'm a little bit lower on Laporta based on the things that we talked about, kind of how he might be ranked next year if he has another good, good season. But the tight ends come down a little, and people say, well, Amon Ra's, you know, a problem for him for target volume reasons. Like, basically, what Kittle gets. No one thinks Laporta's bad, but... I rank him 209 here because I think he's going to get some of that Kittle FUD where it's like, oh, he's got other good players in this team. But the Pitts and Kincaid discussion is interesting because we've talked through it, Sean, as McBride and Kincaid and Pitts as as really kind of the, the profiles that have this clear ceiling this year at tight end. And we both ranked McBride aggressively. I couldn't quite get there with Kincaid despite having... 
had some you know long conversations with some of my buddies, including uh, my buddy Pat Corain, about him, where I really defended his profile. I charted all of his first team snaps uh, in, in week one of the preseason. Was really encouraged by his usage. All the stuff about Knox playing more was mostly just Knox coming in alongside Kincaid. There was one snap with Josh Allen where Kincaid went off and Knox played as the single tight end. Every other snap was either a two tight end formation or Kincaid was the one tight end. Then there was some two tight end formations where Kincaid got out into the slot and ran vertical routes, which was a big thing about his ADOT last year was too low, except if you really break it up between the two, the two coordinators under Joe Brady, his ADOT was actually meaningfully above average. It was over nine. And, and so, the, you know, I thought that slot fade that he ran was interesting. Like, I, I think they actually might use him as a as a big slot and as a vertical weapon that that Ken Dorsey didn't in the first half of last year. I'm talking too much about Kincaid for somebody who didn't rank him. I want to get your thoughts on him at 205 and, and sort of how his season plays out. Because there's a lot of concern, I think, about his role, about these other guys. The other thing we saw in, in preseason week one was, you know, Keon Coleman played all the snaps with the first team. But Curtis Samuel came off for Sun. Khalil Shakir came off for some. Samuel, probably a veteran thing. He's had injuries before. But these guys were rotating at receiver. To me, Kincaid got used like potentially the focal point of the offense. People who are really in the weeds might note that he did catch one pass and it wasn't from Allen. I'll note that Allen came out in the middle of the drive at the end of the first quarter. Kincaid played one more snap with Mitchell Trubisky ran a quick out and they threw it to him on a like a, fir- a clear first read. They got him a catch and then they took Kincaid out too. And so the way that I read that was like, he was coming out with Allen, but they kept him on for one more play to catch a pass, which almost to me was like, I mean, they're making a point that this guy's their dude. Like, and then he went off and then Knox continued to play a little bit. And then Knox came off, you know, a few plays later, but he, he continued to play with Trubisky. Kincaid was done at that point, basically done right at the end of the first quarter when Josh Allen was done. That's the preseason week one stuff that I thought was intriguing. But uh, obviously you having him at 205, you have him as your tight end four. You you have four tight ends in your first, you know, 17 picks. Maybe that's the, the intriguing thing to talk through as well. So part of this is going to be about calibrating for sort of what expectations we should have and how good – Dalton Kincaid might be sort of overall, right? So you have a guy who was picked in the first round. He's picked ahead of players like Sam Laporta and Michael Mayer. Now Mayer is no longer viewed in the same light, but Mayer came in to that draft process as someone who was thought very, very highly of as well. You think about some of the reasons why that might have happened. In his final year at Utah, Dalton Kincaid goes for 890 yards, but it's not just that. The peripherals were fantastic, right? He scores eight touchdowns. He has 410 yards after the catch, which is second only to Brock Bowers, who did gap him. He is second in yards after contact, again, only to Brock Bowers, who did gap him. But he also has the additional peripherals, which give you confidence and then he has 11 broken tackles and nine forced missed tackles which is in line with what bowers did bowers three more games but the same basic number of routes for those guys and when we think about that again it's similar to sam laporta so there's this possibility that because of the way the different offenses are set up because of the different things the teams are trying to do that the gap between laporta and kincaid might be slightly overstated. Even if there's a meaningful gap there, it doesn't mean that Dalton Kincaid couldn't still be very, very good. So then you look at what he actually did as a rookie and we, you know, pull up tight end premium scoring. And from week seven on, he is a juggernaut, right? Averages just under 14 points per game. But within that, you have a 19.5 game, a 20 game, a 23.1, 18.6, And then in week 18, when they are in this sort of must win environment with the Miami Dolphins, he hits for 18.9. The thing that some people will note, I think we want to keep in mind is that part of that stretch was when Dawson Knox was out. And then when Knox comes back, the snaps are not as good. The scoring is not as good. For me, again, this is the point where being a rookie 
matters, where I think that that type of problem tends to disappear to an extent in year two. If for no other reason, then the coaching staff should be going back and looking at what happened and saying, anything that we do to knock down the guy who is our star is probably a tactical mistake. Now, there are going to be lots of people, I think, very justifiably say coaches do that all the time, right? They've given you this signal that Knox is a problem and Knox is still part of their plan for 2024. Don't ignore it. The balancing part there is that their receivers are terrible. And so for this offense to work, it has to be centered around Dalton Kincaid. If you have a breakout potential star at tight end who was fantastic in his final year in college put up big numbers across a wide number of games as a rookie. And now the offense needs to be built around him to succeed. That would be my bet. And I think that the volume kind of center for him gives you a very good floor, but then you have not just like the 95th percentile outcome, but you have a lot of these above 50 percentile outcomes where Dalton Kincaid really pushes your team into the range where you get other things right and you're going to be very good. You can even get other things wrong and you're going to be in the mix, right? Dalton Kincaid is the league winner, tournament winter winner type of bet as we look at what he would do in year two. And then if he does that, I mean, he's going to be a, a foundation piece in round two going forward. Obviously very compelling stuff. So you have him at 205, and then right after our our first half, you have you have Naku at 206, who I have at 203. We talked through that. I have Nico at 207. You have him at 210. We're obviously very high on the Texans. There's this element of the, the teams that we're playing. We both have the three Lions that we were talking about. And, you know, the way to play the Texans was intriguing. We both ended up with Nico here. I have Tank right on my just miss. And I, I I wanted to get – Tank, that was a guy that when I went into this exercise, I was like, I think he should be in there. But – because Diggs is on a one-year deal. And, I, I mean, he just is going to be a fun part of their future passing game. And, obviously, you know, we're very high on the Texans. But it was difficult to get him into the second round. Again, I think it's going to be a really competitive second round. If we did a third-round exercise, Tank would have definitely been in my third round. But you, you have Nico at 210. I have him at 207. We, we both still have him certainly up there. We both took one Falcon. And I have Drake London at the top of my just missed. And I had him right there with Chris Olave. But the reason I didn't put him at 212 is I do have both Bijan and Pitts in my first two rounds. And it was the same thing on the team level that I was just talking through. It's like, I didn't know if I want to put three Falcons. I, 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 the Falcons are a team I really want to be on on this year. And I think people are going to want to be in on next year because I think they're going to hit in a big way this year. I think their offense is going to be really fun for fantasy. I think they're going to be a faster pace. I think they're going to be more pass volume. I think Kirk Cousins throws a more catchable ball. We're going to see higher catch rates and better efficiency in addition to more volume. I think we're going to see higher snap rates. There's a relatively weak schedule this year that's going to, I think, inflate their offensive you know, play volume and things like that, where their defense is going to probably play better than they should because they're playing some bad teams. This gets back to what I was talking about with McBride Harrison, and I think people are going to get back to with you know, tight end value versus receiver value as we move forward. That I think all these guys are going to hit. I think Kincaid's going to hit too, and I Kincaid was the hardest one for me to leave off. And I almost should have just put him over Alave and had four tight ends at the back of my second round. Because this is my tight end too, Kyle Pitts, Sean. But I think Kyle Pitts hits in a way this year that everyone realizes they were too low on him this year just because of the two years prior, essentially. And we get back to Kyle Pitts is a unicorn. Kyle Pitts is big and he's fast and he's a high dot player. You've expressed some concerns about whether he actually tries to catch the ball or runs hard. And his coaches expressed some of those concerns or his, his quarterback has expressed some of those concerns. Obviously there are imperfect elements to Kyle Pitt's profile, but the guy's still 23 years old. He is big. He is fast. This team has talked about nothing but wanting to feature him since they brought him in. They have him rooming with the quarterbacks at camp. They, I mean, you know, for, we've talked about all the stuff in the off season. They wanted, uh, you know, and Kirk Cousins talked to him about the the number eight Jersey, Right. Pitt said, I, you know, you don't have to donate any money. Just give me some targets, basically, was the report. And Pitts ended up keeping number eight. So maybe Cousins said, I can't throw you the ball. I don't know what it was. But um, I do think that Pitts... It's like we got Daryl Mooney, dude. Don't, don't push me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I do think Pitts is going to be this guy in, in 2024 
where we do finally see the thesis come together. The way that he's ranked is like, I think is like an emotional hedge. And I, I wrote about t- today too. Like I, w- I would have such a hard time having him in a bunch of leagues and rooting for him if he doesn't score again this year. But I, I, like I legitimately in this offense and the way that things are going to change, find it really hard to see that the floor could be as low as even the stuff that he's done the last couple of years, that basically his median outcomes and even some of his sub median out, like the very, the slightly below average outcomes are including more points than we've seen. They're at least like small hit scenarios and, and, and then to where he's drafted this year. And then I think, I really do think there's some big, big, you know, some meaningful big hit scenarios. And and the thing that I've been coming to lately, Sean, is we're obviously in on this, this offense from a fantasy perspective. Bijan's ranked in the first round. Drake London's going at the one, two turn. And I like Drake London. Like I said, he was very, probably my, my, him and Kincaid were the two that would have been at my 301 and 302. My biggest near miss, but he's ranked at the one, two turn. And I've advocated for it. Because I do think the volume could be really, really strong for him too. But that buy-in about the offensive trends and all that stuff, it just means that Kyle Pitts is an absolute smash in the sixth round to me. I mean, I I understand that they're not the same player. And there's more talent-based concerns for Pitts. But with the tight end element, and in tight end premium, Pitts is going you know late third this year already. Yeah, Yeah, so the fact that I'm pushing him into the second round isn't like, I'm not taking him up from the sixth round. But if one of these guys is a second rounder next year in tight end premium to me, I, I guess the point I'm saying is I think that their production could be a lot closer than the market has it in those like half PPR leagues, like underdog, right? There's a big gap between them. But what the question I would ask is what if Kyle Pitts is actually better than Drake London? What if he's the number one? I'm not saying that's very likely, but I do think it's likelier than their ADP suggests there's any reasonable question. We don't know for sure that Drake London's a stud either. He's had the same issues with some of the offensive stuff. We know that Pitts has been hurt. And if Pitts is even just in the same ballpark target wise and and production wise, like I suggested with McBride, then next year you're ranking him higher as in a tight end premium league. I mean, he's, he's then the asset to have the tight end position being tougher to fill and, and getting juiced up in the scoring would make him the higher pick. So I did go for him as my second Falcon, along with obviously having Bijan in the first round, you had London, at 207 yeah i don't have strong conviction on that other than thinking the falcons will score some fantasy points and my thought here in part was that it probably is still going to be easier for the receiver to score and i think the structural advantages of tight end so i have drake london in round two next year i think that kyle pitts will be at the two three turn and then pitts would still be my target right but I think unless Pitts absolutely destroys the world, which I am in no way saying (laughs) isn't very possible, then I think he's going to still deal with the aftermath of having burned people and being viewed in not quite the same light as he might otherwise be. And there's going to be this element where the people who wanted the tight ends targeted the four guys that I have up there. And then the people who, feel like they need to address receiver are going to look at Drake London as the easy way to do that. That's a, a kind of wishy-washy way of saying, um, I think both guys are going to do pretty well. And I'm just wanting to, to put a receiver in there instead of tight end. Yeah. You're trying to, you're trying to read the market too, a little bit as well, which is one of the parts of this exercise that is, you know, tricky for us, but that is a, a good point. So my, we, we mentioned the front half of the second round, my back half of the second round, involves a bunch of tight ends that we've already talked about. There's one name on here we haven't mentioned. It goes, for me, starting at 207, it goes Nico, Pitts, Laporta, Jonathan Brooks there as my RB6. Again, Sean, your entire first two rounds only have four running backs. We mentioned this in the first show. Um, Brock Bowers is my 211. Chris Olave, my 212. Jonathan Brooks pretty much goes without saying, obviously, had the, the ACL. Was a, a round two pick that a lot of people thought would have been maybe a late round one if he wasn't coming off an ACL. He goes to a Panthers team that maybe won't look good enough for him to go in the second round next year. But I do think that people are going to be excited to draft him quite a bit higher next year. No, basically, no matter how his rookie year goes, because we don't really get to play him this year. But I think we'll see enough late in the season, probably, that he's going to get pushed up. And and because of that void at the like RB6 range, which we've talked about, right? Like there's not a, a lot of young, great, exciting talents that he's going to 
be in this RB6 range. Now, the way you have it is that only four running backs are going in the first two rounds, which I think helps explain why why you don't have Brooks there. I'm not like taking some massive stand on Brooks. I think people listening to this were expecting Brooks's name to probably come up at least in the late second round at some point. I do have him there. And then I have Bowers and Olave, as I mentioned. Your second half, Drake London, as we said, Xavier Worthy, AJ Brown. I have those two guys in the front half of my second round. Nico Collins, who I had at 207. And then you have two receivers at the very end. You mentioned having a few sleepers, a few names that you snuck in. You always have some fun ones at the end of the second round. The two that you went for that are going to climb all the way to the second round next year. I mean, I I went to Rasheed Rice at 202. You had to put him at 211 and 212. Like, obviously, you don't have much conviction in these guys. But <laughs> are Jaden Reed... And Jackson Smith and Jigba. I don't think the JSN one shocks anyone. You've talked a lot about Jaden Reed being multiple rounds undervalued uh, is a phrase that I've heard you say. And I know you're very high on, on Jordan Love and this Packers offense. Talk a little bit about why Jaden Reed, JSN, make it in there for you, even over guys like Jalen Waddle. So I've got 6,000 words up on the site on JSN. I encourage people who like really want to get into the weeds on it to check that out. I looked at it from a variety of angles, Ben, which there, I mean, there are lots of visuals. There are lots of tables, not just the words. If you, so, if you don't want the 6,000 words, you just want visuals. There are visuals there also. Or you could also give them the cliff notes that you wrote 6,000 words. Sean Siegel did that much of a deep dive and he ranked Jackson Smith and Jigba at 212 in his 2025 first and second round. So pretty, pretty strong uh, breakdown of those 6,000 words, I would say. Although I do encourage people to read them. It's a fantastic piece. That one is a little bit of a passion project for me and obviously is the one that's most likely to be wrong. If you want to say JSN is not going to go in the first 10 rounds next year, I am certainly fine with that take as well. Jaden Reed, I think, though, is weird. Where, Ben, I, for a long time I did the rookie or I did the breakout season series, the wide receiver breakouts, looking at year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. One of the things that's kind of interesting about year five, which Blair found again in his most recent wide receiver series, which is absolutely fantastic. I mean, I'm biased, of course, but uh, I think Pete made a video with it. People have been raving about it. Check out that series from Blair. Year five is actually kind of interesting because you do get some team change situations that can act as a catalyst. And some of these guys who maybe weren't drafted with the idea that they were going to go on to be good NFL players. That was the other thing that I always found was that if you could stick around to year five, there was a chance that at that point, your team's like, you know, this guy who, you know, we didn't think was going to be any good, but it's still here. Maybe we should let him play more and see what he can do. So you do get some of that, but the year one breakout players are almost all stars. They have the best remaining production in terms of what they do from that point on Jaden Reed despite not being a starter last year scores over 200 points he wins all of the tournaments in week 17 with the ball in his hands you know he looks like he's a, a video game player the Green Bay Packers have been able to get guys like Watson and Reed and Dontavian Wicks wide open <laughs> all the time and the person who is kind of in that intersection between not a huge risk, but also someone who's already demonstrated. So for me, when you're looking at like, what's the ranking of the guys or what's the, the pecking order in terms of how they're going to be used. And then how does that intersect with talent with Watson? You have these concerns with the soft tissue injuries and the fact that he has not done it to the level that Jaden Reed already has. And then with Wicks, you have this concern that he just simply won't get enough opportunities. Now, certainly in best ball where he's priced and what he's likely to do on the limited opportunities he has, <laughs> I think you still want to be in. But Jaden Reed fits in that overlap where he's going to play plenty. He's already demonstrated he's a star. This offense is going to be very efficient. Having him take a step forward in year two and just being like a, a clear-cut, easy second-round pick, for me, all the signs are aligning and point in that direction. I love it. So that is, that is the, the second round, Sean. So for you, uh, we matched 11 players in the first round. Um, you had Bowers in the first, I had a Chan in the first, just to sort of recap 
for you, Reed and, and JSN were two that you threw in there. I didn't have Reed even in my honorable mentions. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I had a different Green Bay Packer in my honorable mention, and that is Dontavian Wicks because I know I know Ball, Sean. He was my seventh honorable mention. Not exactly my first, but I mean, I think if a guy actually does some really tremendous stuff for this Packers passing game, I think there's a possibility that it's Dontavian Wicks, right? But um, we some published of the guys... like five articles on him in the last sure. three weeks, so – if you there's, haven't, then you're I mean, not in the fantasy football community. It's 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 a requirement. <laughs> there's some smoke there. There's some smoke. Kyron Williams is one that we didn't get in. Jonathan Taylor is one that I had in my my um honorable mentions that we didn't get in. Waddle, I mentioned. I had T. Higgins. The 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 camp buzz is so big on him, and he could even be in a different city next year. He could have a great year and then and then go work to a different team. I've compared him to the way that the camp buzz was on Brandon Ayuk last year at this time. I don't know that, you know, he's going to have the same kind of year that Brandon Ayuk did, but you could, they gave him a lot of work in that first series of the preseason game as well. They threw Burrow threw deep to him in double coverage and he almost came down with it. Then he drew a DPI on a third down. Then he caught a TD. That was all after catching a, a pass on an RPO on the first snap. I mean, like just everything on the drive was just like, all right, well, where's T Higgins? Uh, it would be pretty scores. easy to see T. Higgins like swapping in for Nico Collins, for example. Yeah, Tank Dell scores a preseason touchdown. Honorable mention name there as well. I threw a Dunze on my list, Sean. I'm sure he wasn't an honorable mention for you because you think he sucks. But he's then they're saying be... that they're saying that Keenan Allen looks like. Well, he spent some time with me at the buffet, so <laughs> yeah, maybe, he's like maybe a Dunze. <laughs> Maybe a Dunze <laughs> spend is some the guy time to be with on. you at the buffet. Sean, the breakdown at the end is you have four running backs, four tight ends, and 16 wide receivers in your first two rounds next year. I have six running backs, four tight ends, and 14 wide receivers. We certainly think that the trend of wide receiver taking over the early rounds is here to stay. Even for me, as, as I had Bijan and Brees 101 and 102, which we talked about on the first show the majority of my second round was wide receivers, right? And even in this tight end premium format, you also put together, uh, you know, a best ball version of this, which I didn't do because you didn't tell me to do. Uh, <laughs> but your, your best ball version has four running backs and only two tight ends. Um, it does have, you know, Bowers and McBride there, but brings in some more receivers. It brings in Debo. It brings in Zay Flowers at the end. So those are a couple of your honorable mentions clearly and makes it so that you would have in your, top 24 in best ball 18 wide receivers with the four running backs and the two tight ends the wide receiver trend we're saying definitely here to stay i think so i i always like to mention that a season like 2016 is possible but you also have to look at what the profiles are of the running backs and how teams are now playing it you had mentioned jonathan brooks as being at the end of your round two i think that's really interesting i very excited to see how he looks and the i don't know if i'm excited exactly to see to watch the panthers but i do have a lot of interest in what they end up looking like if bryce young takes a jump that will be a lot of fun i think there's a little bit of a wall for me where i didn't include a few of the names at running back that you had but i think that we could see a chan kyron williams and then maybe like Kenneth Walker create this uh, a bit of a dam that Jonathan Brooks would have to somehow breach to get into that top group. Now you already have HN obviously much higher, but Brooks versus Williams and Kenneth Walker. And then Travis Etienne was the other name that I had there. See if he can jump past sort of vault those guys. That will be interesting to track for uh, this season and then how it, manifests next year in ADP. So that's the first and second rounds of 2025 redraft. I guess, I mean, a quick recap. I think last year I read them all. So I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll do the quick recap. I was trying to, to not do it, but the people probably want to hear it. Sean's is Justin Jefferson at 101, Garrett Wilson, CeeDee Lamb, Jamar Chase, and Tyreek Hill at 105. Five straight receivers to start, then Bijan Robinson, Brock Bowers, Christian McCaffrey, and then back to receiver with Amon Ross St. Brown and Malik Neighbors. 
And then Trey McBride and Brees Hall to finish out round one. At the start of round two, Marvin Harrison, Jameer Gibbs, Sam Laporta, Chris Alave, Dalton Kincaid, Puka Nakua, Drake London, Xavier Worthy, A.J. Brown, Nico Collins, Jaden Reed, and Jackson Smith and Jigba. Seven receivers to close out round two. Mine, a lot of similar names, a little bit of a different order, starting with B. John Robinson and Brees Hall in the first two picks. C.D., Jefferson, Chase, Garrett Wilson, and Tyreek come in next for me there, the same five receivers as you started with, Sean. Then CMC at eight, Neighbors, Amon Ra, Trey McBride, and then Devon Achan at 112. We talked about him on the, the, the first round show. <clears throat> somebody that you didn't have ranked there, but Xavier Worthy and Rasheed Rice at 201 and 202, Puka Nakua, A.J. Brown, Jameer Gibbs, Marvin Harrison, Nico Collins, and then the back half of my second round, the tight ends that I, you know, I, I only had one tight end to this point. You had four by this point, but I have a bunch of tight ends in the back of the second round. Kyle Pitts, Sam Laporta, Jonathan Brooks, Brock Bowers, and Chris Alave for me at 212. 